Hello folks, I hope you're enjoying our online revive. Perhaps not as much as we all enjoyed not online last year and the year before that and the year before that, but we have developed a kind of an approach to the seminars so that we do go into them in some depth and dealing sometimes with difficult passages. Well, this afternoon we're going to look at something in the book of Revelation, and that for some of us is difficult enough, isn't it? Which is a little reminder to say that also what I shall be doing will be a little bit of a promo for when eventually um, we're going to get my book out on the book of Revelation. Um, but um, So it's like a bit of a promo, and it will, I'll remind you from time to time that um, by next summer I hope we'll have it out. But this is just a taster and it's from a passage which perhaps is one of the better known parts of Revelation. There are lots of things that merge into each other, slightly confusing when you go to the book of Revelation, but this is to go to it in some depth and the passage that I've got in mind is one that was put into my mind by faith and is going to be read to you by Joe. So it's a kind of a family event, but um, in the, it's uh, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Now, Apocalypse is just the word translates into English Revelation. We usually refer to it the Book of Revelation, but if you were... Uh, Greek speaker, you'd say it's the book of, well, you wouldn't say the book of, you'd say something else, the Apocalypse. And the this um, book, Looking to Our Lord's Return, and many other deep and wonderful truths, has this, which has been painted by most famous painters, and some very unfamous ones, of pouring horses ready to go, to thump and cause a thunder and to cause the noise of their hoofs because it's speaking about some of the disorder that arises at the end of this age when Jesus is uh, coming again. And we, um, we shall look at some length at the passage which now Joe will read to us. Thank you, Joe. Starting in Revelation 5, verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and dominion for ever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the centre of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, 
and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now those four horsemen seem to be bringing quite a devastation into the earth. And yet it is important to notice that they are brought forth from the throne of God by the living creatures. And the living creatures are just uh, the spirit powers that lie behind life and which represent all life before the throne of God. And so... We have to ask ourselves, is this what God really wants? And there are perhaps other times in the Bible when you've read things and you think, does God really want to do this or does God really want to do that? And hopefully as we look into this text, we, are, we won't answer all the questions, but we'll get a little bit of the issue of the if you like, the bad things that God seems to do. How can such a good God as we know him, who loved the world and gave his son in order that we might have life and to redeem as many as possible, uh, would he want to cause these devastations? Is this um, the sort of God that we worship? Which, which God is it? Is the one who loves us or is it the one who is going to send these things on the earth and the living creatures who um, are so close to the throne of God, we can't really disassociate them from God's will and God's administration of the earth and God's ability as a creator to keep the creation going. Well, that is one of the important factors in the meditation of looking into these texts. But... Um, Right at the beginning, Joe read to us from chapter 5, where we see the one who is first of all called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You know, Jesus came from the line of Judah. And um, he also is then seen, but not as uh, a roaring lion, but he's seen as a lamb as it were slain. And a slain lamb is one of the most perhaps weak and pathetic things that you can really take in. The sort of thing that uh, breaks your heart if you're a farmer and one of your lambs has gone, but it lies there completely helpless to do anything for itself. And uh, it's, it seems as though it's the last creature on the earth that should represent the almighty God but this is of course the son of God who's given himself for us and the slaying is what took place at Calvary and it goes on and it shows how the universe in its spirit powers reps those we've seen already the four living creatures and then thousands upon thousands of angels and then the 24 elders they're all around the throne, worshipping and praising God. And these things begin to take place. And they take place because each of the four horsemen is called forth by, it would appear, each of the four living creatures who form a part of the throne of God, almost. You might compare it to statues that are placed around some... Um, statue like um, Nelson in the middle of Trafalgar Square and you've got the four lions around it well these four living creatures surround the throne of God the one who is uh, um, in a sense ordering but he's doing it through the living creatures these horsemen to begin to ride before we go any further we ought to think a little bit about those horsemen and start to get a feel of what they are. Are they totally spiritual? Are they producing things which are uh, more literal? These are always things we have to grapple with when we're studying the book of Revelation. If we went back to 
the Old Testament was a good place always to start studying a subject, we find that these different coloured horsemen appear in the first chapter of Zechariah. And we're told exactly what they do. They patrol the earth and it's all at rest and at peace. There's a red one, there's a white one, there's a black one and so on. And, uh, the, and then again when you get to chapter 6 it seems as though the colour of the horse has taken over the colour of the chariot because we've now got the, the colours but they are of the chariot as well as the horse that pulls them and uh, they turn up again there. So they are to do with God's administration amongst the nations at that moment in, in the book of Zechariah. It's the Persian Empire that's in view and it's time for them to take their hands off Israel and let Israel rebuild its temple and start to pull together a, a new life which they thought was completely devastated and lost forever. And that is the background of these um, different coloured horsemen and their riders, horses and their riders. And so we can expect a change to take place in the order and the functions and the histories of the story in the book of Revelation. And uh, as we look at the very beginning and we think that these great devastations are going to be hitting the earth, there's bloodshed, there's um, death and pestilence, there's, uh, there's a, if you like, a virus that's taking a sway over many people, the plagues. These things are coming upon the human race and uh, we need to know what uh, is happening, why it's happening this way. And this is what God's revealing to us in chapter 6 of Revelation. The reason why we read the end of chapter 5 is just to take up the word that occurs many times, but um, in many of your texts in chapter 6 verse 1 it starts with the first word, Behold. And most texts it might be just, And I saw. Well, I want you to keep your eyes on the Lamb of God in the midst of the throne because as we keep our eyes on him we're going to be in the place of stability and where things will make sense in the end and where things will be um, a part of our uh, protection from what's taking place on the earth. So put your eyes on Jesus, the crucified one in the throne of God, the Creator, and uh, we trust that he's going to help us to see something of the devastations that are taking place here. But we need that stability to be uh, fixed on Christ. When do we ever get told not to look unto the Lord? All the way through the Psalms and other places too, to look unto the Lord, to keep our eyes on him. When we keep our eyes on him, we keep our ears open too to him. And we keep our mouths, can I put it this way, because we are breathing in the very presence and the breath of the Almighty God and living in his life. Because when we became Christians, we started to share in the life of God. We began to breathe his breath. We began to live by his power and energy and direction. And if we keep our eyes fixed on him and we keep on breathing in and taking in with all that we are, we'll be carried into the meanings of the horsemen and why they're there. And um, so let's look at the four of them together. They obviously look as though they should, in a sense, be kept together. And I don't disagree with that, but that doesn't mean to say that if horsemen number three, four and five are not up to much good, they're destroying and so forth, um, it's uh, 
nonetheless we've still got the first one and we don't have to interpret the white horse as a part of a four, four, uh, four horses entity. Now you'll find that the majority of expositors of God's word will keep those four together in such a way that they have to be interpreted all as something bad. Now that's difficult. I find it difficult if the white horse is interpreted as something bad because um, simply because there's a red horse which is bloodshed, there's a pale horse of death and Hades and uh, there's um, a terrible coloured one which is um, pale, black, black. And that um, those horsemen are obviously conveying something a, a little bit um, bad, maybe even evil. And yet uh, the white horse, whiteness all the way through the book of Revelation, and before it too for that matter, speaks of something good. White robes are given to those who have given their lives for Jesus, and they're told to rest because their, retro their um, recompense will take place. They will find that they were doing the right thing when they gave their lives for Christ. Something the devil is always telling us not to do because it will be a waste. But those who poured out their lives and were persecuted for it, they will find that they were on the right track and fulfilling God's eternal purposes, which is far more satisfying than it fulfilling any of our small purposes on life. So the white horse is going to appear again when we see Jesus coming on a white horse in chapter 19. As he comes on a white horse in chapter 19, we're caught up to ride with him and we ride with the king and again on horses that are white horses. So Jesus has a white horse, we have a white horse representing all the pure energy that God gives us, the pure energy to, to ride and to go forth with him and see his victory in all the earth. And uh, we might just notice too, in verse 4 it says, and another a red horse, and it makes a bit of a break by saying, and another, another horse rides but it's the white coming after the white one although it's another of the same sort it means of course it's another spirit power which is at work in these forces and it follows the one that perhaps was where the holy spirit has been working in all the white robes and the white um, the whiteness and cleanness of their robes washed so I want to suggest that there is an intended break there with a little hiccup of another making a break with the next three horsemen and that uh, distinction is that the first horse is overcoming and to overcome. The word to overcome there is the same one as you get in the book of Revelation at the very beginning where it says, those that overcome I will grant to give to them this, that or the other. And it's an encouragement to sacrificial service to the Saviour. And uh, we overcome and we, um, we are holding on and getting God's will and God's work done. It is the same word that is used, strangely enough, for the rise of the Antichrist. Which is why some people say all four riders represent the rise of the Antichrist who takes over the earth and governs in it. Another last world dictator. We've had quite a few dictators over the centuries, but this is the last one and the worst one and one that's going to bring the devastation and chaos that the other horsemen seem to represent. So um, if we make a division and <clears throat> say the white horse is the advance of the overcomers 
he that overcomes will sit with me in my throne. <coughs> as I also overcame, says Jesus, <coughs> and sit <coughs> on my Father's throne. So the, um, I would like uh, to interpret that white horse as the overcoming advance of the overcomers in bringing the gospel into all the earth. We know we're getting pretty close to that because we've read just way back that there were those in verse chapter 11 out of every tribe, tongue, kindred, people and nation who were worshipping there. So we're pretty near, uh, nearly reaching world evangelization for as, the, um, as we carry the word out and people receive that word, um, repent, be baptized, you will receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in all his purity has taken up a body of folk who are still carrying the good news as the Lord told us to, to the ends of the earth. Now that advance of the gospel does not bring uh, a sort of a Sunday afternoon rest. Um, it brings a challenge into our lives to be labouring with him in his vineyard. And the, in the midst of all that work, there's going to be persecution. And the persecution is the next horse that rides. Verse 4. Another and a red horse went out, and to him was who sat on it. It was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men should slay one another and a great sword was given to him. It clearly is indicated, um, is indicating conflict, violence, the red horse referring to the blood that's shed, as they slaughter one another, they slay one another, and it's maybe a surprise, but the advance of the gospel until it becomes worldwide out of every tribe and tongue and kindred and people and nation and covers the whole of the earth, that kind of advance doesn't immediately bring peace. It brings disturbance because disturbance is one of the breaks or the hindrances that the enemy is at work to stop the advance of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're under persecution, it's more difficult to keep on winning men and women for Christ. There will always be those who see the glory on the face of those who are martyred for our Lord Jesus, and they will turn to him in the last resort, as it were. But um, the glory of the kingdom that we love and we are so pleased to be a part of already as the kingdom finally reaches its destiny and the whole world is filled with the glory of the gospel and anywhere, anywhere now people can know the truth of Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit we can, we can say that if that time is just about arriving now there will be bloodshed and hindrance and violence that doesn't mean to say these things have never happened before. We've seen uh, different ways in which you can interpret the book of Revelation. And certainly, I think it would be uh, an interesting exercise to pick out wherever there's been great advance in the preaching of the gospel into all the world, that you will find there comes disorder and violence and persecution. And that is what we've got here. So in another sense, these four horsemen all do belong together. The catalyst of the scene is the overcomers going out and finishing world evangelism. The reaction that takes place is uh, disorder and violence. Sometimes it's been amongst the believers themselves, which is sad to say. 
and those who name the name of Christ persecute others who are naming the name of Christ because they think the way they're doing it is far better than anybody else and they're the ones that ought to be in charge. I'll say no more about that but leave you to start to think about a little bit of church history and see if that's not true. Um, in verse 5, and when he broke the third seal, that's the seals are being broken. This I may as well point out here, I think, to help you in the interpretation revelation. The seals open up the bits of the scroll so that what's in that scroll then starts to take place. And Jesus is the only one that could be found who could open that seal, had the right to open those seals and eventually get God's work on earth done and his purpose of producing men and women who are like himself who carry the character of God and uh, his ways um, he is the only one that's worthy to be able to take God's eternal purpose and break it open and get it done and that's what's happening in this so there are seven seals to break off and these horsemen ride each time a seal is broken. As we get to the last one we begin to find that we find that there's another set of sevens and there are seven trumpets that blow if you like under the final breaking of a seal. The seal's broken, there's silence in heaven and then seven trumpets are blown and then in the seventh um, then there are seven signs they're not laid out quite so obviously as the others, but they're there, as, uh, they're called signs, but um, they clearly are seven signs. They also contribute to the onward movement to the final end point when God will wind up the universe and there will be a great judgment. But as we, who, who can get this rolling? Who can get it done? It's only Christ who can break the seals. He's got the purity, the selflessness, the self-denial, and has paid for it all with his blood. <coughs> and he now is breaking the seals, and then the trumpets will blow seven of them. Then there will be seven signs, and then under the last sign, there are seven bowls of God's wrath. Something else that we need more time to, to think about. Um, that wrath is mentioned at the end of this chapter if you look and the great day of our of the wrath of God of their wrath sorry their wrath that's God and the Lamb has come and who is able to stand and uh, they're crying out and saying the kings verse 15 the kings of the earth and the great men and the commoner and the rich and the strong and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains to and to the rocks fall on us hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb is a strange concept, but it's the wrath, of course, um, that has been expressed in the death and of our Lord Jesus, the wrath of God. But um, these horsemen are bringing this kind of chaos in. One of the things, one of the models I've tried to uh, um, express is that um, if you remember in Colossians, in John's Gospel, in um, Hebrews, Jesus is the one who upholds all things by the word of his power. He created all things and by him um, all things are and exist. That's John's Gospel. In Colossians it speaks of he, all things consist or hold together by him. 
the creator is still maintaining the universe. And you see it at this stage of things that um, if the universe is something like a glove and God's got his hand in it and he's upholding all things, keeping it all going, the point has arisen now that he's taking his hand out of the glove because he's going to bring in by the end of Revelation a new heaven and a new earth. Now you imagine taking off a fairly tight glove. I was going to bring one to show you. And you pull it and push it and there's all sorts of disorder and disaster. That's why we've got all these disastrous things happening. The Lord is moving away from the old creation to bring in a new heaven and a new earth in which there dwells righteousness. And in order for that to happen, as he lays down the old and takes up the new, it appears, especially because of the rebellions he's had in people's hearts all over the earth, there is going to be great disturbance. And that's what these disturbances are about. Disturbance here in possibly the people of God as well as everywhere else. That's the red horse riding. Then comes the next horse, verse 5 of chapter 6. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, third living creature saying, Come. And he looked, and behold, a black horse. And he that sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard, as it were, a voice in the centre of the four living creatures saying, now the centre of the four living creatures is the throne of God. So this presumably is God's voice. A, qu um, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. So that is speaking of famine conditions. We've had plagues recently in this world. We've had disorders and violence and war and murder. And we've now uh, got another one of the characteristics of human beings. This time there is um, hunger and famine. And I don't know whether you're aware, but at the moment there are many famines throughout the earth. And uh, there have been locust famines where the locusts have descended and eaten up in East Africa and there are there's a lack of food in so many parts of the earth at the moment that it's becoming more and more dismal to our ears to hear of another place where they need food and they've got to find food somewhere and can we give more to the sustaining of our fellow men and women in other parts of the earth there are always cries for how to feed everybody. And this um, is a rather intricate way of saying it, but it says that one, that uh, you, get, you work for a day and you get a penny. That's according to Jesus' parable. A penny a day is a general weight, uh, work for a workman, and he feeds himself on that. But if he's got a family, he's got to buy barley, a cheaper cereal and uh, he goes to the barley and he can buy um, three uh, or a quarter is it um, a quart of quarter of wheat for a, a denarius and three quarts of barley so he can feed his wife and two children that's the kind of picture again. This is a famine condition. And after the famine condition, obviously death arises. And in verse 7, when he broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked and behold an ashen or a pale horse. And he who sat on it as the name Death and Hades was following 
with him. Horrible picture, death sitting upon the horse and the horse going forward and following the horse behind him is, um, is uh, Hades. Death and Hades. I don't know what distinction we should make between those. Death is dying. Hades is the place of the departed. And they're both there to mop up the dead, I think. Um, they're working together. And he was following. Um, and one fourth of the earth is affected. To kill with a sword and with famine and with pestilence with a virus, and by the wild beasts of the earth. These pictures have been used in the book of Ezekiel before, warning us that those who disobey God and try to live in God's world, their way of their self-will, rather than God's way of his will, they don't pray the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth, they don't pray that, and the result is that there is a reaction taking place, and they're finding that by trying to live in God's world their way, they are causing great harm to other people as well as to themselves. It's killing everything off in the end. <clears throat> and pestilence is running riot. And... Uh, the wild animals, the beasts of the field, as they did in the book of Ezekiel, they are taking over because there is nobody to herd them, to govern them, to care for them. Um, and in the nature and its wildness now is in control. God put man on the earth to govern animals in the right way, not in a cruel way, but to govern them. And human beings were meant to order life and society. Instead, here there is disorder, chaos, continual thunders of come and go, and the different things are taking place. And the horsemen are beating their hooves as they ride from one thing to the next. It is a seriously devastating picture. And... Um, little bit of comfort in the middle of it, in the end of it, that there are those who've died in the persecution that's been pursuing them, that they cry out to God. People don't like them crying out to God, surely we forgive our enemies. Well, yes, but we do also want to see justice on the earth, otherwise other people will suffer. Sometimes it's a selfish indulgence if we don't stand up for others. And uh, that isn't the way of living Christ. We've got to suffer for them and with them. And this is what um, is being missed out on as the world goes into greater chaos. As God, as it were, is pulling the world off like a glove and shaking it before he starts to bring in a new heaven and a new earth. Now, all of those things are warning notes to us to be living for God in his way, in his world. And in the end, although we don't see it here, we're going to see it later on when the Lord comes forth riding his white horse and the whole world is brought back into the order of the new heaven and new earth. I want to see a little bit of what it will look like, or he will look like. And I thought the best place to turn was similar to that horseman in the Psalms. So if you just turn into Psalm 45, <clears throat> we sometimes say it's, this is all about the Queen, but you look at it carefully, you see it's about the king as well. There's a new king coming. And the queen is there. That is the people of God, the bride of Christ. They're there as this bridegroom, new king, takes his place. 
Psalm 45 goes, My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the King, King Jesus. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. The Holy Spirit's quickening his tongue and he's wanting to write quickly. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs generally flow at the presence of the King of Kings. You are fairer than the sons of men. Christ was more beautiful in his character and life and actions than any of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. When he spoke, it was full of the ability to do what he said, because grace goes with it. The ability to do it goes with his words. Grace is upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you there forever. Gird up the sword of on your thigh, mighty one, and in your splendour and in your majesty and in your majesty ride on victoriously in the Greek translation of the Old Testament that's the same word as we had of overcoming for the cause of truth don't we need people to be on the cause on the side of working for and producing truth for the cause of truth in a world full of lies and meekness, where there's so much arrogance, and righteousness, treated, treating each other properly, and walking before God, our Creator, properly. Let the right hand teach you awesome things, for arrows are sharp. The pe people fall under the you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Now there's a prediction of our Lord Jesus. I didn't pick it up in the book of Revelation, but in Revelation it tells us the white horseman, he had a bow. So he had a bow and presumably arrows. And the arrows go into the heart of the king's enemies. That's the way that God is going through his words, which are like arrows, piercing into our inner beings so that his word is what governs us and drives us and motivates us, illuminates us, gives us great happiness on our lips as we start to speak the things of like a ready writer, a motivated, spirit-filled writer. And we see of the victories of our Lord and then in verse 9, we have thought on the loving kindness, O God, in the midst of the temp your temple, and is your and is your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. See, there's no doubt about it that the person who is being referred to here is called God. And it's God who is riding on that horse, and it's God who is shooting the arrows. <coughs> but they're not arrows of destruction, they're the arrows of God's truth. <coughs> Your right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion and go around her. This is the final city of God where the saved will dwell together with him and he tabernacles or temples amongst us. That's why it's been referring to the temple. Count her towers, consider her ramparts, go through her palaces that you may tell it to the next generation, for such is God, our God, for ever and ever, and he will guide us until death. <clears throat> that is the one that we've been considering, whose word it will, world it is, 
and how as he starts to bring it into a new phase, there are all these disorders that have to be observed, recognised, shaken out, <clears throat> and then the new age can come in and take their place. That culmination of your throne, O oh God, as our Jesus is called, O oh God. Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. Scepter of righteousness is your scepter. <coughs> we see this quoted in the book of Hebrews in chapter 1. And we certainly, we can enjoy, not ourselves, we can enjoy the victory that has at last come <coughs> to the Saviour who deserves it. He's broken the seals, <coughs> he's set in motion the recovery, recovery of God's eternal purpose. And with those of us who followed him, maybe even unto death, are now rejoicing eternally with our God who is forever and ever. Amen. What a hope, what a destiny, what a thing to live for, what a thing to die for. What else is there that's worth living and dying for? But the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. Ride on in your majesty, Lord. We love you for your majesty and righteousness. We love you for what you've done. We love you for all that you've planned for us for eternity. Anybody like to say amen? <laughs> amen. <laughs>